everybody, and welcome to our service at Northwest Bear United Church. It is Sunday, June the 13th, and I'm here in one of my very favorite places. I know I always talk about it, but all the amazing trails that we have uh, around Barry, just outside of Barry in Springwater. Love to go walking and, and running on these trails. But I'm here today because it is the season for gypsy moth caterpillars, and uh, as we all know, they're everywhere. And I just want to share with you how much I absolutely love these things. Like they're my new favorite creature. First of all, I love the sound they make. You can walk in the forest and you can actually hear them regurgitating the food uh, that they're eating. And it, it's just a, it's an incredible sound that just fills the whole forest. But not only that, but I mean, they're just, I've got one right here. He's so cute. Like they're so furry. When you see them hanging from the trees, it's like Cirque du Soleil when they do their little, their little tricks. So they're almost like pets. So what I did was I got a aquarium and I filled it with about 30 of these little guys. And then uh, I added all kinds of leaves so we would feed them. And then they're gonna turn into gypsy moths. And I'm hoping if we can keep them alive, keep them alive until September. And then on our first Sunday, uh, when we're all back together, I, I'm gonna let them go in the church and fill the church. And it'll be this great symbol of new beginnings, of, of regeneration. So. I'm super excited about that. So something to look forward to. Okay, so our ninth commandment today in our series is thou shalt not bear false witness, which means thou shalt not lie. So I just wanted to show you how easy it is to break that commandment. I don't really like these gypsy moth caterpillars and I'm sure you don't either. They're a pest, they're ruining our trees. Uh, who knew we were gonna get a pandemic and then followed by a plague. So we're all hoping that they eventually are going to move on. Anyway, today is about um, uh, lying and uh, the, four, uh, the ninth commandment. So we're going to go back into the church. I think we're gonna have a little fun with this commandment after uh, a couple of tougher ones. So I think, I hope you're going to, uh, to enjoy it. Okay, let's get back. Come on, little buddy. We're going to church. See you inside. Well, welcome back inside everyone and again, Welcome to our service. We're really glad to have you here on this Sunday morning. We always like to begin by celebrating the milestones going on in our church community. And I don't have any this week. Nobody sent me anything, but that doesn't mean that there aren't birthdays and anniversaries and celebrations happening. So if you are celebrating, hope you're having a great today and a great week. Maybe this morning we can just all think about celebrating the fact that at least here in Ontario, we've moved into another phase of opening and we can sit on a restaurant patio and we can gather with more people and soon, really soon, we'll be able to get a haircut again and maybe go to the gym. So it's a great feeling. It feels like we're finally, finally getting there. But I also know that I jinx things when I say that from the pulpit, so I should probably just stop at that point. Uh, there are a couple of announcements of things that are coming up. This coming Friday, we're really pleased to host a graduation ceremony for all those uh, from our church who are graduating from either grade eight or grade 12. We did send invitations to all that were on our list, but it doesn't mean that we didn't miss somebody. So if you have a child that's graduating this year, please let us know. We would love to uh, have them come out and join in the celebration. Again, that's this coming Friday. Our headlines group meets again on Wednesday morning. Information is in Northwest News. Uh, June 26, this is something new. So just a couple of weeks from now, we're going to have um, kind of a year-end event. I know there's not a lot that we can do, but we are going to host a car rally. Um, it's not a race, just a chance to get out in our cars and our, our families or as individuals and uh, go and tour some of the sites in Simcoe County. Um, so there will be a, a map and, and all kinds of things to go along with that. So uh, if you would like to attend, again, all the details are in Northwest News. You can sign up and that's on Saturday, June the 26th, starting at 10 o'clock in the morning. On that same day, in the evening at seven o'clock, we're really, really thrilled to have the home version of Spring Melodies, and I know a lot of work has already gone into preparing for that night, so we hope you'll join us for what I know will be a great evening of music and stories. And finally, just a word about the summer. You know, we are getting closer and closer, just a couple weeks away. I did put in Northwest News our plans for the summer. We are going to remain open, uh, or at least continue with online services uh, throughout the summer. 
Uh, when I'm away, we'll have um, some guest people, I think uh, most of whom you will, uh, you will recognize that we'll be filling in. And then, uh, fingers crossed, uh, we hope that by September we can open our doors to however, however many we can open our doors to and we can uh, get going again with in-person as well as online worship. So that too is something to celebrate this morning. I'd like to begin our worship time now with our call to worship. So listen to these words. The morning dawns, and with it dawns a hope that today something special could happen. Today a frown could turn into a smile. Today a burden could reveal a blessing. Today a kindness could turn someone's world around. Today a wrong could be righted. Today, God's love could be glimpsed, revealing a new truth. So let us greet today with song and story, prayer and praise, and see what it could reveal to us. Our opening hymn today is one that you know well, Jump for Joy. So if you want to jump for joy at home, please do. you to please join me in our opening prayer and uh, let us pray. God in whose infinite presence is revealed intimate gifts, we approach you in prayer. We come to you with a grateful heart, made grateful by moments of grace and connection. We come to you with a seeking spirit, one that longs after a peace that can settle itself even in a passing storm. We come to you with an adventurous mind, hungry for new truths, thirsty for new ideas. We come to you with an open heart, one that wants to be healed, one that wants to be filled with meaning and purpose. We come to you to find our place in the gospel message, A message that says that in love, there is always healing and promise and joy. We come to you to be reminded again that despite its challenges, its questions, and its heartaches, life is a great gift, and there is so much goodness in the world. And so we worship, and we open ourselves heart, mind, and spirit to your presence with us. Amen. Our special music today, as we continue to celebrate the month of pride, is uh, a song called We Are Rainbows. I hope you enjoy it. We are
Thank you for that great song and uh, that great message. Today, as we take a moment, as we always do, to reflect on our virtual or online offering, I do have some really good news to pass along. We, uh, as many of you know, had a spring financial campaign that we called Keep the Porch Light On. And uh, the goal was to raise $10,000 for the work of the church. At the official end of the campaign, we were still about $1,500 short of that goal. But since then, more donations have come in and we have now surpassed our goal. So my thanks to everyone who contributed to the campaign. It really helps us as we head into these summer months. Again, without the usual summer revenue of rentals and weddings and so forth, we are truly extra grateful for all of your gifts. Again, doesn't it feel like we're almost over the last hump that we are getting so much closer? So let me just offer a short prayer of thanks for the offering from this week. Every gift is a seed, and when planted, offers the promise of something good and fragrant and colorful and life-giving. And so we give thanks for all the seeds planted here at Northwest. And we give thanks for those in Barrie and beyond who are planting those seeds of promise and hope. And we await with anticipation for the harvest of many good things that are to come. Amen. As I mentioned uh, last week, or maybe the week before, one of the, the blessings of COVID, one of the few blessings of COVID, is that we've been able to send uh, our service out to many people uh, beyond the walls of our church and beyond even our church community. Um, many of the people that we're sending it to are, are folks that have uh, moved away from our church, but still are able to tune in. And today we're going to go to one of those places. We're going to take a little trip to Huntsville. And I'm sure all the people here certainly remember the Mullen family, Chris and Scott, and uh, sometimes Callum and Liam, when they're at home, are up there. Uh, they're also in school. Um, but we're grateful today to, uh, to have them uh, share our Bible reading. It's going to be uh, Chris. So let's go up to Huntsville and listen to the words of the Bible. The first reading is taken from Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 to 9. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone, for God is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. And from the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. Then Jesus said to those who had followed him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This week I'm continuing with our uh, sermon series called Tuning Up the Ten, looking at the Tenth Commandment, and I can't believe we're already at commandment number nine. We're, we're almost there. Uh, so as I said in the beginning, our commandment is thou shalt not bear false witness. Let us pray. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O God, our strength and our light. Amen. 
two boys were having a very intense discussion in the corner of a classroom. So the teacher walked over and asked them what they were talking about, and uh, one of the boys said, well, we found a $10 bill on the road on the way to school today. So we're having a discussion as to who gets to keep it. Okay, said the teacher, so what did you decide? Well, said the little boy, we decided that whoever tells, gets away with the biggest lie today gets to keep the $10 bill. Well, the teacher's face became flushed as she picked up a put up her finger and she says, well, you boys should be ashamed of yourself. When I was your age, I didn't even know what a lie was. So you guessed it. The two boys gave the teacher the $10 bill. Thou shalt not bear false witness. I don't know about when you learned the Ten Commandments, but when I learned the Ten Commandments, I was always taught that this one was very simple. Do not lie. And as we'll see in a minute, it is deeper than that, like all the commandments. But on the surface, it really is that simple. To bear witness is to provide false evidence of the truth or alternative facts, as one well-known former president was fond of espousing. But I'm not going in that direction today. But to bear false witness basically is just that. It is to lie. Lord, oh Lord, how the world is given to lying, wrote William Shakespeare. Have you ever told a lie? Well, of course you have. The better question might be, have you ever told a lie? Have you told a lie yet today? There's no question that 100% of us have stretched, bent, or broken the truth at some point or another. Maybe to cover something up, or to gain an advantage in a situation, or to make ourselves look or feel better. Lying is a part of human nature. It is a survival to a honed over millions of years of evolution. And we are all susceptible to it. There's that old story, the theology professor who was talking to his class of potential ministers, and he asked them one day, how many of you have read uh, the 17th chapter of the Gospel of Mark. And a bunch of hands went out. The joke, of course, is that there is no 17th chapter of the Gospel of Mark. Mark is the shortest gospel. There's only 16 chapters. And believe it or not, my first year at theology school, my professor actually did that. My professor of New Testament, he asked the class, how many of you have read the 17th chapter of the Gospel of Mark? And I was amazed at how many hands went up. Now, I'm very proud to say my hand wasn't one of them. I'm also not so proud to say it wasn't because I wasn't being honest. I just really wasn't paying attention. I didn't hear the question. I remember having to ask the guy beside me why everybody was laughing uncomfortably. Anyway, lying is a skill. And it's one that we learn pretty early on. Few are better at bending the truth than our kids. At least many of them. In a study done a few years ago, researchers put a group of three-year-old children one at a time into a small room, told them to face the wall, and then they told them they were putting behind them a really neat, shiny to toy. But they couldn't look at it until the researcher told them they could turn around. And then the researcher left the room and said, I'm going to be gone for a couple minutes, but don't look at the toy. He would leave and then go and look behind two-way glass to see what would happen. What percentage of those three-year-olds do you think turned around and looked at the toy? 100%. So now he went back into the room and he asked them, did you peek while I was gone? What percentage of those three-year-olds do you think admitted to peeking? It was about 50%. And the other 50% sheepishly admitted that they had peeked at the toy. They then did the same experiment with children who were five years old, so two years older than that. Guess how many five-year-olds turned around and looked at the toy when the researcher left? 100% still. Researcher goes back in. Now, guess how many five-year-olds admitted that they had lied? 100%. Proof that we learn pretty early on that there is value to be had in lying when we feel certain that we can get away with it. And if you are a parent, 
I'm sure you're nodding your head. We know this about our kids. And at some point, we've all had to have that conversation with our kids about lying. I still remember when I was a kid, I had a broken tooth from playing hockey. So this tooth here is a false tooth. And about a year after I'd had this tooth put in, my brother and I were supposed to be watching cartoons in the basement, but we were play fighting. We were, we were being boys. And I'm not sure what happened next. Either my brother hit me in the face or my face uh, hit my brother's knee. It depends on which of us you ask. But the outcome was that my fairly new false tooth popped off, broke off, and landed on the ground. I still remember sitting there looking at my tooth on the carpet. Well, we were terrified to tell our parents. So we came up with a plan. I put my tooth back in my mouth, and then I held it in there with my tongue. We went upstairs, and my brother said to my parents, who were in the kitchen, can we have a couple of apples? Now, that should have really tipped them off, because what boys want apples on a Saturday morning? My parents got us a couple of apples, and I bit into my apple, and oh, lo and behold, my tooth popped out. Now, my parents are watching this this morning, and I bet they, t they didn't even know that, that story. So, sorry, Mom and Dad, your perfect little boys were uh, maybe not so perfect after all. I'm sure you have a similar story of when you were a kid or of your own kids when you were a parent or a grandparent. Unless we think that we're the only species on the planet that can lie, apparently we are not. Years ago, a famous research project was done with two gorillas named Michael and Coco. Maybe you remember this. They taught these two gorillas to use sign language and then watch mesmerized as the gorillas learned to communicate with each other through sign language about everything from the food they were eating to the temperature of the, the place where they were in. Well, one day the zookeepers watched Michael grab a much-loved stuffed animal and tear it to pieces. They then went into the enclosure where they were and they, they asked Michael, through sign language, who had torn apart the stuffed animal. And you guessed it. Michael threw Coco right under the bus. Like it or not, we are born with the capacity to lie. Some of us, researchers tell us, do it better than others. So I want you to do an experiment with me. I mean, really, we're really going to do this experiment. You can do it at home. I'll do it here. Um, so let's do this together. This was an actual experiment carried out at Harvard University. I want you to take your finger, and I want you to trace the letter, the capital letter Q on your forehead. So do it now. Just trace the capital letter Q on your forehead. Done? Okay. After you did the circle for the Q, you would have put the little stick on the Q on one of two sides. You would have had it pointing down to your right eyebrow or pointing down to your left eyebrow. If you put the stick pointing down to your right eyebrow, that meant that you were drawing the Q so that you could see it. If you put the stick down to the left side of your left eyebrow, that means that you were drawing your Q so that other people could read it. A subtle difference, but an interesting difference. What researchers found when they did this experiment is the vast majority of people will write the cue so that they can read it with the little stick going over their right eye. They just naturally do it. But a minority will do it the other way. They'll do it this way with the stick pointing over their left eye so others can read it. They don't think about it either. They just naturally do it. The minority, the researchers discovered, tend to be people who are very aware of other people. They are very aware that others are looking at them. They are very aware, therefore, what people think about them. They are often people who live their lives trying to earn the approval or the respect of those around them. Which do you think, according to this research project, are the best liars? those who write the cue so that other people can read it over their left eye. According to this research project, they are more likely to bend the truth to get people to like them, or to get them on side, or to gain an advantage over them, 
because the approval of others means so much to them. I hope I didn't stress you out with that experiment. Because now you're worried that you put the stick to the left and now you're a liar. Well, think about this. First of all, always take these things with a grain of, of salt. But I know we all know that. But think about this too. The other conclusion that the researchers came to in this experiment is that those who put the cue so that others can read it, maybe they do lie more, but they also tend to be more successful, have higher levels of achievement, happiness in their life. So you can go with that conclusion if it's more palatable to you. You're not a better liar, you're just more success oriented. So don't stress about it too much. My point is we know only too well what it means to lie. And just as an aside, do you know what we lie about the most? A whopping 80% of us claim to have lied about this. We have lied about ourselves on a resume or in a job interview. Basically to make ourselves look better or to make ourselves seem more employable. You ever done that? You ever say to an employer, I love to work. I'll put in 60 hours of, of work a week. And then 5 o'clock rolls around and you're the first person down in their car revving up the engine to go home. I'm sure you never have. Me neither. So where do we go with this? Well, like I keep saying over and over again, we've tended to reduce the Ten Commandments to their simplest of moral imperatives. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do the other thing. But there is so much more to it than that. The ninth commandment is not about your everyday lies. In fact, there's ample evidence in both the Bible and in other writings of the time that not only was lying not a criminal offense, but at times it was even encouraged, especially if it would save your neighbor from embarrassment, for example. You know, the old white lie, as in, yeah, I love the fact that you painted your garage door neon pink. Now remember I said last week that what the Ten Commandments have in common is that they are all capital crimes, meaning they all carry the threat of capital punishment should they be broken. So clearly, therefore, bearing false witness was not about your standard everyday lies. So what is it about? It's not a moral commandment it, as much as it is a legal commandment. To bear false witness is to commit what we would today call perjury. It is to bring false evidence into a court of law against somebody else. Or to put it simply, it is to lie to a judge. According to the laws of Old Testament times, for somebody to be convicted of a serious crime, two witnesses had to come forward and say that they saw the person commit the crime. That was the magic number. It couldn't be one, it couldn't be three, it had to be two. Here's where it became a capital offense. Again, according to these old laws, if you were to bear witness against somebody and it proves that you were the one lying, you could get the punishment that the person would have received if they had been found guilty. So let's say you and your friend don't like your other friend and you want to get them in trouble. So you go to a judge and you tell the judge that you saw your friend shopping at Walmart on a Sunday morning instead of being at church. Because back then, that was a capital crime. Thou shalt not work on the Sabbath or do anything on the Sabbath. But then if the minister steps forward and says, no, no, your friend was sitting right there on the front row, just where he should have been. Guess who's getting stoned to death later that day? It sounds like a crazy system, and I'm sure at times it was a crazy system, but that's how justice was handed out back in the day. You know, there's one very famous example in the Bible. We've all heard the term a Jezebel, which usually means someone who is sneaky or dishonest. I don't like using that term because it's been used in the past mainly as a slur against women. A dishonest woman is being referred to as a Jezebel. But the term itself came from a story in the Bible that highlights the reality of bearing false witness. As the story goes, 
the king of Israel, King Ahab, wanted to purchase the land of his neighbor, a guy by the name of Naboth. He wanted to turn it into a vegetable garden. But Naboth refused to sell the land as it had been his family for generations. Enter Jezebel, the wife of King Ahab. She thought the vegetable garden idea was a great idea. So she put a dastardly plan into place. She wrote a letter to the elders of the community instructing them to find two scoundrels who would bear false witness against Naboth and say that they'd heard him cursing God, which, again, according to the Ten Commandments, was a capital crime. Thou shalt not use the Lord's name in vain. So the elders do just that. Two scoundrels are found, a trial is heard, Naboth is found guilty, and he is stoned to death. And Jezebel enjoyed many years of string beans and radishes in her beautiful new vegetable garden. Hence the term, a Jezebel, meaning an unscrupulous person. FYI, karma gets you every time. Jezebel will come to her eventual demise by thrown out of a high window and then being eaten alive by dogs. Ah, the good old days. Don't you just love Old Testament times? It's almost like every story in the Old Testament could be a, a Netflix miniseries. So does this commandment have any real value today? To be honest, of all the Ten Commandments, in my opinion, it really does have the least to say about our everyday lives. Because we don't have that system of justice anymore. We don't require two witnesses to corroborate a crime. We don't force the witness to bear some medieval punishment for lying in court. It's apples and oranges. But that being said, the, the modern concept of perjury is a throwback to the days of bearing false witness. But we all know that. We, we all know it, that it's not cool to lie to a judge. Hopefully none of us will be in a position where we have to even think about that. So what relevance can it have for modern living? Well, through the generations, different thinkers have found a lens through which to try to make it relevant. Martin Luther interpreted the commandment to suggest that this was a commandment as to how we should treat our neighbor. He went so far as to say that we have no business telling on others for the misdeeds that they do. For to do so, he said, or he wrote, is to compromise our relationship with our neighbor, which he believed was paramount to a good and healthy faith and community. So if our neighbors are having a party with 20 people and there's no masks or social distancing in sight, and we are tempted to call the bylaw officer, Martin Luther King would say, or Martin Luther would say, don't do it, mind your own business. Or in his words, to tell on someone is to judge someone, which he says is clearly not ours to do. Judge not, lest ye yourself be judged. He said God alone could be our judged, with one exception. He said there was one profession of people who could also be our earthly judges. Guess who they were? Preachers or ministers. He called them preachers. He said preachers alone have the right to tell on people to the authorities. So watch out. Keep those masks on. Keep social distancing because I'm watching you. Now oh, I lost my place. Anyway, we see maybe that there's not as much relevance to this commandment. So let me just very briefly do what we've been doing with some of the others. Let me just turn it around for a moment. We've talked about lying. We've talked about bearing false witness, stretching the truth, whatever you want to call it. All of these things are the opposite to what? All of these things are the shadow side to what light? The light of honesty and truth. The opposite of thou shalt not bear false witness is thou shalt strive to live from a place of truth. Jesus was purported to have said this to his closest friends, and, and Chris read it for you today. He said, If you follow my way, then you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth 
and the truth shall set you free. I know I say this often, and I do because it's a point that needs to be made over and over and over and over again to all of us who set our lives on striving after the example of Jesus. And it is this. Jesus' mission in life was not simply to make us better and more moral people. Jesus' mission in life was to find the truth and then to use that truth to change the world, to change the very fabric of society. He saw a world of great injustice, great suffering, great heartache, great inequality, held together by power, held together by lies. Lies such as, God wants you to accept your lot in life. Lies like, God is watching and waiting for you to slip up so you can be punished. Lies like, certain people are clean and certain people are unclean and unworthy of the community. And the biggest lie of all, you have to earn your way into the good graces of God or you will be condemned forever. These were the religious lies holding together the first century faith of that time, upheld by unscrupulous and power-hungry men, Jezebels. Jesus came along and Jesus said, forget it. This is not the way it's supposed to be. I'm bringing you a new vision. I'm bringing you a new truth. And the new truth is this. You are worthy of your life. God wants the best for you, does not expect the worst for you. There is no clean or unclean. There's just people. And the biggest truth of all, it's all about love. God's love is an unconditional force of good that does not require you to earn it. It just invites you to live from within it. This was the truth that Jesus believed was needed to embrace in life, to live in freedom, to live the courageous and fearless and empowered lives that were a gift to us. A gift to us, not a burden for us, a gift to us. Jesus didn't come to tinker with our morals. He came to change our vision, to invite the world, to invite us, to a new truth. The truth of love, the truth of justice, the truth of compassion, the truth of freedom. Because that ultimately is the ultimate truth, to be free. Researchers are right. We are liars. But I'm convinced that the greatest Lies in life that we tell are the ones that we tell ourselves. When we tell ourselves we're not good enough, when we tell ourselves we're not worthy, when we tell ourselves that we have a right to exercise power over somebody, when we tell ourselves that others have a right to exercise power over us, when we tell ourselves we can't make a difference, when we tell ourselves we have to earn love, when we tell ourselves we can't let go of the things of the past, we are lying. We are lying to ourselves. We are keeping ourselves imprisoned by those lives. We are keeping ourselves from living the best that we can be. Could you not say that to bear false witness is to turn on ourselves, to become judge and jury to ourselves, and to condemn ourselves? to only a portion of what our lives could be. Because every time we say, I can't, I can't forgive, I can't move forward, I can't understand, I can't grow, I can't change, I can't, I can't, I can't, we're lying to ourselves. And those lies become bigger and deeper. They start to calcify in our hearts and in our spirits. They start to close in until they become a solid, immovable part of us. And we think, there's got to be more to life than this. There is. Because Jesus said, we can. We always can. We can forgive. 
we can move forward. We can understand. We can learn. We can change. We can grow. That's the greatest message of the gospel. That tomorrow, that every tomorrow, is an opportunity to start afresh. When we stop living in the shadows of lies, lies, we start living in the light of truth. The truth that Jesus embodied, the truth of living fully and freely, compassionately and courageously, happily and hopefully. And when we do, we will know a freedom that can change us and that we in turn can set loose and help change the world around us. The truth will set you free. There's a really beautiful fable, and I know I've shared it a couple of times in a couple of different ways. But let me just share it again this morning. A little girl had been orphaned. She was very unhappy, very fearful about the future. One day she was out for a walk, and she came upon a tiny little butterfly that had become trapped in a thorn bush, unable to get away. So the little girl stopped and carefully moved the branches so that the beautiful butterfly could be free. And just before the butterfly flew away, it turned into a magical little fairy. And the fairy said, thank you for setting me free. To reward you, I will grant you one wish. The little girl thought for a moment and she said, I just want to be happy. Then I shall tell you, said the fairy, the secret of happiness. The fairy whispered into the little girl's ear and then disappeared. Well, that little girl became the happiest person in the land. Everyone wanted her around. Everybody wanted to listen to her. Everybody wanted to be friends with her. Everyone wanted to know her secret for happiness. But she kept it to herself. Finally, she got to the end of her life. And as she lay drawing her last breaths, her friends gathered around her. They asked her again and again to please share the secret of happiness, lest it die with her. So she smiled up at them, invited them to come close. And quietly she said, Long ago, when I was unhappy, a fairy told me never to let myself be trapped. To not be trapped by negativity or fear or worry or doubt. But just to be myself and to live for others. For that is freedom. And I have. And I have lived a very happy life. Thou shalt not bear false witness. You know, maybe in the end it really is as simple as the very first way we learned this commandment. Do not lie. Do not lie to a judge. Do not lie to others. And most especially, do not lie to yourself. For you were not created to be trapped in a thorn bush of your own making. You were made to be free. A freedom born of the greatest truth there is. The very truth that is at the heart of the gospel. That you are loved. And therefore you are love. Amen. Please join me in our closing prayer and then... Like we do every Sunday, we're going to sing the Lord's Prayer, and hopefully you can uh, sing or share at home. Let us pray. Gathered in prayer now, we ask ourselves, what did I hear today? What message found its way through the walls, the protections, the barriers that I may put there each week? What was the, re the message that resonated with me? 
Am I feeling challenged to turn a can't into a can? Am I feeling the need for insight? To go deeper into myself to see if I have been lying to myself about something. Maybe it's time to bring that to the light of freedom. Have I for too long felt like something else or someone else has had control of my life? And I'm ready to take back what is mine. To reclaim the gift of my life. What stirred us up today? What calmed us down today? May we take the heart of this service and the heart of this message and may it sit with us. And as it sits with us, may it find a way to drift to places within us that needs grace and healing and courage. As we continue, God, in prayer today, we think of the news that we've heard this week, the things that we have seen this week. Last week, we were saddened by the news of a mass grave that was uncovered. This week, our attention was snatched by news of a car crash that killed a family, targeted because of their faith. We grieve these losses as we grieve any loss. We grieve the hatred, the darkness, the callousness of such acts. But help us not to stay in that dark place for too long but instead to look up and to see the light that still shines. The light that urges us and encourages us to keep being light, to keep being love, to keep showing the world that there are good, tolerant, decent, kind, and compassionate people who only want the best for others. And now our prayers, they are just as important. What are we praying for? Who are we praying for? God of truth, who seeks freedom, may we cling to your truth that all are created in love and for love, and that all of us are created with a capacity for joyful and meaningful lives. May we carry that message with us today and in the days to come. And hear us now as we share together the, the words of prayer taught to us long ago, the words of the Lord's Prayer. Once again, thank you so much for coming today and for joining us, and I hope you have a wonderful week ahead. I think it's going to be a little bit cooler this week. So I'd like to end by sharing with you some words of benediction. These words were written by a minister in the Unitarian Church. Her name was Cynthia Landrum. We leave this gathered community, but we don't leave our connection, our concerns, or our care for each other. Our service to each other, the world, and to our faith continues. 
Until we are together again, friends, be strong, be well, be true, and be loving. Amen.